All right, friends. Johannes Hausschein was his real name, but this, as was the common custom, he gressicized to Oculumpadius, Greek for house lamp. His enemy slightly transmogrified this to Cacolumpadius, a lamp that sheds no light. Citizens of Basel found it a mouthful and nicknamed him Klaus Bader, or Nick the Bather, or prompted by his monumental pendulous nose, pendulous nose. Here's a picture of him. We can pass that around if you'd care to. Uh, look at that schnoz. Looks like a real party animal. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> they, uh, prompted by his monumental and pendulous nose, old nosy, they call him. His is the story of a sensitive, introverted academic forced by events to become a leader in a very rough ecclesiastical struggle. With his piercing black eyes, yellow jaundiced complexion, squared beard, and Cyrano-like schnozzle, you couldn't miss him in a crowd. But his saintliness was as distinctive as his appearance. His high character became a byword in Basel and beyond. Born within months of Luther and Zwingli, our scholar-to-be got an early start in his studies. <clears throat> Attending a Latin school as a little boy, uh, like uh, the total immersion language programs that you have where you're punished if you utter one word in your mother tongue. So early start, we might say, in another sense, also by the clock as well as the calendar, for his lessons began at 5 a.m. in the summer with only one hour reprieve in the winter. Speaking of early start, I should, I should add, since my oldest daughter is here, I had a, a gallery of portraits of the reformers in our home when the girls were, were born. And occasionally graduate students would come in and they'd be able to pick out a few, oh, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, yes. Ooh, who's that guy with a long nose? And uh, Vienna was just a toddler at the time. I'd say, well, ask her. She'd be in her high chair. He'd point to the picture and she'd say, look at the potties. <laughs> so she got an early start on these two, as did they all. Well, day by day, little Uncle Empatius was observed creeping to school like a snail with all the enthusiasm of a boy going to the dentist. But <clears throat> he survived the early hour and assimilated his curriculum sufficiently to matriculate at the University of Heidelberg in 1499. <clears throat> this placed him in the Rhineland circle of humanists who avidly pursued linguistic studies. Reuschland was the great giant of the German humanists, the greatest scholar north of the Alps, that is until Erasmus challenged him and took the title. Uh, Reuschland championed the sacred languages and above all the importance of Hebrew studies. And under his sway and by great diligence, Oculumpadius achieved something quite rare in his day, uh, certainly in our day also, um, which uh, brought him a moderate renown. He mastered three, the three sacred languages. Uh, he, um, so Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, those were the languages. He also happened to know Aramaic, he spoke French, German, and Italian, and German too, so he had about eight other languages. But uh, uh, thus, homo trilinguus, they call him, or the triple tongue, was added to his list of nicknames. His enemies preferred Cerebus, Hell's three-headed watchdog. So it was a, it was a hardy age for uh, for nicknames. Uh, despite this singular suitability for theology, Oclopatius was almost diverted from this path. For when the Black Plague hit Heidelberg, his university town, his father in alarm sent him to Bologna in Italy to pursue a career in law. Well nigh diverted. But the fellow who was entrusted with the tuition proved to be a fiend and absconded with the money. So penniless, Oclopatius had to return to Heidelberg and begin theology again. So thankfully, uh, thankfully, God 
afforded that providence, as he does all. Uh, during his university days, Oklopatius met and befriended Philip Melanchthon at Tübingen, and also at Heidelberg, Wolfgang Capito. And they shared their books, their enthusiasms, ideas, and eventually they'd even share a life. <clears throat> but that's another story. Uh, Mrs. Oculampadius would become Mrs. Capito on the third stage of her matrimonial peregrinations. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that next. Uh, Oculampadius <clears throat> also came to know Erasmus intimately and teamed up with him in preparing for the press the biblical and uh, theological works in Greek and Hebrew. <clears throat> but as editor, Oculampadius proved that however ample one's scholarship, one's proofreading capacities are only as good as your eyesight. He, uh, and alas, like the half-healed man of Mark 8, Oculampadius could hardly tell a man from a tree at any distance. And the first edition of Erasmus's New Testament that he uh, proofed was perhaps the most misprinted work in all of history. Mm. Unbelievably bad. Uh, well, this didn't alienate uh, Erasmus from him. They, Erasmus and Oculampadius, remained really good friends despite some doctrinal differences. Uh, Oculampadius cherished a letter that he had received from Erasmus. He even had the thing framed and, and it sat in his, uh, on his study wall until someone came in and stole it. Erasmus became so famed that somebody came in. So watch your, watch your, <laughs> watch your letter from Erasmus there. In 1518, Oculampadius' studies culminated in a Doctor of Divinity from Basel. Interestingly, he was at this time shortlisted for the professorship of Hebrew at uh, Wittenberg. Uh, Oculampadius admired Luther and benefited much from his gospel, Luther's gospel clarity. <clears throat> Many of the things said by him, Luther, are so certain to me now, even if angels from heaven contradicted them. They would not change my convictions. So that was the impact of Luther for him. Oh, you're all right. You're Mr. Hinkley. I am indeed. Thank you. What are you teaching about? Oculampadius. That's a Oculampadius. mouthful. Oculampadius. He's a reformer from Basel. So you will. <clears throat> I'll continue the story, and I think you'll enjoy it. I'll go right ahead. <laughs> That's his picture. <clears throat> Yet, alas, this uh, uh, this prestigious post with all of its church chores left for his taste, Oculopatius' taste, not nearly the time craved for study. His discouragement grew, and he pined for a more retired life. Until quite suddenly, without consulting anyone, at the time when most people were leaving monasteries, he joined one. Uh, simply, it seems, for the opportunity for un unmolested study. At the Brigantine convent, they were only too glad to receive him, especially on discovery of the size of his personal library that he bought into the bargain. <clears throat> but contrary to every expectation, Oculopatius was unhappy at the monastery. Even after a friend brought him a pair of spectacles so he could read better, his doldrums did not dissipate. What's a doldrum? Uh, his moroseness. Oh. What's moroseness? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> as much as he loved his studies, he realized that he cared deeply for the progress of the gospel. And cloistered away in the convent, he could contribute nothing to the reform cause, in which so many of his friends were so valiantly laboring. And he sensed that Christ's call was to a life not of comfort, but one of crucifixion. <clears throat> the catch was he had sworn an oath to stay in the convent. So what was to be done? Well, the bookish scholar found a way out. He discovered a clause in the fine print of the bylaws of the order that a member might be expelled to avoid the contagion of heresy to the monastery. So Oclampadius begged them to consider his Protestant reformed notions highly contagious and warranting expulsion. So grudgingly, they finally conceded uh, to do this, but only if he would throw in his precious library 
as a parting donation to them, including his glasses. They even demanded that he leave his glasses so people could read his things. <clears throat> so, Oklampadius quit his cowled companions and headed for the big city. Uh, luggageless and squinting, no doubt. Uh, he was out of home, out of a job, and out of money. It seemed to have boldened him, however, as uh, he had nothing more to lose. Nothing. It was all gone. Back in Basel, his old printer gave him a room in his home and a job translating Chrysostom sermons from the Greek. Uh, presumably, he also gave him another pair of glasses, I hope. Now, this task he was able uh, to uh, transform into an effective tool for reform. Uh, noticing in a few annotations the rather conspicuous contrast between Chrysostom, an early church father, Chrysostom's convictions, and present papal practice. Uh, so uh, people would read these and read the annotations and think, oh, gee, you're right. That doesn't seem to match up well. Well, a further door opened. An ailing priest in a Basel church needed a vicar, and Oculumpadius was called. It seemed he, uh, Oculumpadius presented the service in German when he started up, rather than in Latin. And also, so, which was new, and also celebrated a non-sacrificial Eucharist. So he celebrated the he celebrated a simple Lord's Supper as opposed to a high mass when he came into the church in Basel. <clears throat> Thus, in all likelihood, this little church of Saint Martin's in Basel became the site of the earliest Protestant liturgy that we have. The earliest <laughs> Protestant liturgy. Well, to this, he had a lecture series in Isaiah at Basel's University. Uh, public lectures offered in German for a broader audience, instead of the Latin for the learned elites alone. Well, this accommodation uh, to commoners caused the usual assembly of priests and students to swell by some 400 citizens. Well, the popularity of these lectures prompted Erasmus's remark scarcely concealing his prima ballerina-ish jealousy. <laughs> Ocalampadius reigns here. He always liked to be the favorite. Uh, <clears throat> he was also popular in, among some of the town council who determined to shield their Lutheran preacher, he was called, against papal pressure to prosecute him in courts of law. And so shielded through his public preaching that worked its way like leaven into the lump of the populace. Oclopatius was to become the soul of the Reformation in Basel. At this time, there occurred a remarkable incident that made his Basel, Oclopatius' Basel, another first. On Easter of 1526, after just this firm diet of preaching, from Oglopatius, the St. Martin congregation spontaneously broke out into German songs of praise and thanksgiving in the service. This was spontaneous. It wasn't what called upon. Their hearts just seemed to swell, and they just began singing hymns in German. This was unheard of. It was always Latin choir at the time. So this was very spontaneous. It hadn't happened anywhere yet in Europe. Uh, and uh, despite worries about the president, president um, it took, uh, he defended it, and Basel was the first. <clears throat> uh, Oclopatius also promoted the Reformation cause significantly, flinging down the gauntlet in his offering for disputation four theses. The first concerned the prime authority of Christ and his word. In other words, you'll recognize sola scriptura. The second, justification by faith alone, sole fide. And, uh, and also, uh, the third, <clears throat> the impropriety of invoking the saints. No need to pray to the saints. We can go directly to God through the intercession, through the mediation of Christ. Uh, and this was not the common practice in the day. If you were plagued with a problem or a worry, one would direct a petition not to Christ in that day. Rather, more excessively, they thought, some saint, each of whom had a specialized set of skills. Uh, 
So if you uh, wanted safety in childbirth, there was one. Uh, if you had toothache, St. Apollonia, uh, who was martyred by having her teeth pulled out, so it was thought, okay, she's the appropriate one to uh, guard against toothache. Uh, and on and on, they each had, if you were having bowel problems, and I won't go into this, uh, St. Erasmus, because he was <coughs> killed by uh, pulling out all of his innards with a windlass. Uh, oh, uh, so you would, yes, horrific, absolutely worth it. So he, uh, 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 he, he argues for being able to go directly to Christ in your problems. What a lovely uh, privilege that is for us. And then fourth, Christian liberty and the priesthood of all believers. Again, Reformation watchwords. <clears throat> it was good that Uncle Empatius got a few rounds of experience in debate, for he would soon step into a more fearsome ring. After uh, his debate with Luther, you remember in Leipzig in 1519, Eck, Johannes Eck, you remember his picture, uh, as just the complexion of a bull. Uh, he, uh, he seems to have fancied himself the holder of the European title for verbal prize fighting and sent out a challenge to debate all and sundry comers, but specifically called out Zwingli, uh, I will strike down this shepherd, he said, and Ukulampadius, the old blind scholar, he said. Uh, well, uh, both were game, both Zwingli and Ukulampadius, to take him on, but it soon became clear that the debate would have been stacked, would be stacked to one side, for the staunchly Catholic Baden was insisted upon as the location for the debate. And again, he kept having these promises, no, no, we'll, we'll debate you, just come to our province. Then they would capture them and kill them. Uh, so <laughs> this was not going to work. Protestants justifiably feared for their safety and without any guarantee. And indeed, the Zurich City Council refused to let Zwingli go. The result was that Ukulampadius went to Baden all alone. And uh, though he quitted himself with no small distinction, uh, in fact, Erasmus uh, quipped that Ukulampadius, quote, set forth his views with a persuasiveness that would have deceived even the very elect. <laughs> so he was yet outnumbered and outranged and outgunned by the formidable Catholic delegation. Uh, Ukulampadius was arrayed against 100 Romanists in that debate. So the debate proved actually a setback for the Reformation cause in Switzerland and was followed by a notable hardening of opinion in the Catholic cantons against the teachings of the reformers. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Zwingli, uh, who on the basis of the debate, they impugned as a heretic in absentia. But Ocalampadius had nothing to be ashamed of. His learning and sweet reasonableness had more than offset the rambunctiousness of his opponent, Eck, and more importantly, he had for the first time taken the strain of leadership and acquitted himself manfully. The reformers pondered the lesson of Baden, the Baden disputation, and concluded that they must uh, dis dispute only in cities where there was sufficient safety for them to turn out in force. Thus, for the Bern, another Swiss city, for the Bern disputation in 1528, the reformers left nothing to chance. <clears throat> Ocalampadius was teamed with Zwingli and Busser and Capito, and as they all preached during their stay, the sermon tasters had a feast and passed from church to church listening to the leading reformers of the day, a veritable galaxy of homiletical talent. And on this occasion, Ocalampadius and his reformed companions in arms were eminently successful. The disputation had immediate consequences for Bern. Public opinion was so swayed toward the reformers that mandates were passed immediately embracing the Reformation in Bern. <clears throat> it was now Ocalampadius' own Basel which was lagging behind. Three Basel churches had been designated evangelical, and the remaining traditionalist churches, uh, with, with all the remaining churches traditionalist, and uh, with the allowance that each Basler could choose their own church to go to. So you didn't have to uh, report to the church in your own parish, whether it happened to be traditionalist or Catholic or reform. You could actually go to whichever one you wanted to. 
the town council at its Catholic core, uh, well, the result of this, I should say, was that uh, Ucalampadius' St. Martin Chapel just was packed to the gills, filled to overflowing. People were kind of voting with their feet and going there. Well, the town council, with its Catholic core, determined to adopt a policy of procrastination and hoping to keep uh, the surge at bay. Procrastination, to slow and slow down as much as we can, to procrastinate, to put off any change. Yes. Unlike so, procrastination on bedtime or school. Or you can procrastinate on any number of things. No, that's an inspiration. Absolutely. I don't procrastinate. Well, that's a good or at thing. Least I try not to. Excellent, excellent. Grasp the devil, true. So um, the uh, hoping, uh, determined to adopt this policy of procrastination and hoping to keep it, the surge at bay, they passed an edict in 1528 that, quote, every man should abide in his own faith. So not allowed to switch. A feeble attempt to dam up the tides of change. One peeved proponent of the reform quipped that the council was, quote, trying to sit on two stools. But... Uh, through pulpit and press, Protestant preachers were steadily eroding allegiance to the traditional Roman doctrine and practice. Disturbance was in the air, and it was evident that a crisis was near. Oclopatius was at the helm, resolutely preaching the Bible and never missing pertinent applications to the marked disadvantage of current papal practice. <clears throat> Ocalampadius stigmatized as badly educated that conscience which after five years of preaching still held to the mass and the cult of images, which are a worse abomination than adultery. Is adultery, Ocalampadius writes, is adultery against God more to be tolerated than adultery against man? Robbery, whoring, adultery, treason, manslaughter, and murder are not so bad is the blasphemous conduct of the servants of the mass. If one may and should punish thieves, murderers, and the seditious, then in these dangerous matters, the magistrates should not look through their fingers. In the midst of all of this furious agitation and excitement, our Donish bachelor, uh, now in his 40s, realized he needed a wife to keep him in the saddle. By his incessant studies, his health was beginning to suffer, and for all the meals he missed, his enemies jibed that, uh, at him as a walking corpse and a sack of bones. And a wife he acquired, one recently made available by the death of her first husband, also a reformer, we will actually devote our very next and entire lecture to this extraordinary woman, but back to our narrative here. Well, many a Basil Berger uh, citizen, nourished in the gospel convictions by a steady diet of sermons, were incensed by the snail-like pace of reform. And a protest was issued against the town council's policy of procrastination. Now, the evangelicals had been finally granted five churches where the images were to be removed, but this was declared tokenism, too little and too late. The whole city was seething, and it was obvious the council could ignore this popularly backed petition only at the risk of a riot. Accordingly, the council declared the mass was to be restricted to three, celebra three celebrations a day, and the disputation was promised on that topic, but not for six months. Well, this proved not enough for the agitated populace. On the 8th of February, 1529, before dawn, 800 men gathered in the Barfuskirche, and then delivered an ultimatum to the council, demanding the immediate abolition of the mass. But when the council met, with, uh, sorry, but when the crowd met with only further hesitation, the angry and exasperated crowd armed themselves and advanced menacingly to the marketplace. <clears throat> it was as if the Basel citizenry had determined to give up their images for Lent. On the next day, the council again sat, 
while thousands gathered awaiting their decision. But by noon, the people's patience had expired, and the shivering mob surged up the hill to the cathedral square, tearing down the images church by church as they advanced. Gathering them up, they heaped them into the square for an enormous bonfire. Broken images, torsos, heads, arms, and legs of wood and stone, shards of painted canvas, fragments of stained glass, and glittering decorations all lay in heaps. Some of the more economically minded carried off the idols, as they called them, for firewood. <laughs> Speaking of the images of the saints so rudely handled, Erasmus quipped, strange that none of them worked a miracle to avenge their dignity when before they had worked so many at the slightest provocation. For two days and two nights, fire consumed the residue of generations of piety. The issue had been decided from below in a swift and bloodless flurry. The Catholic leaders were honorably dismissed from the council and the evangelical leaders were installed in the city's pulpits, with Oculumpadius assuming pride of place at the cathedral, from which he preached uh, at 8 a.m., 12 noon, and 4 p.m. every Lord's Day. The great Reformation ordinance appeared, 1st of April, 1529, and they weren't kidding, opening with the words, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. Basel had declared itself for the Re Reformation. Well, uh, this interestingly prompted Erasmus, who preferred to shun commitment uh, to uh, finally leave for Freiburg. It's an irony that it was actually uh, Erasmus's, the work of Erasmus that brought Oculumpadius to Basel to help edit the New Testament. And it was the, uh, the work of Oculumpadius in Basel, creating uh, a reformed city, uh, that actually caused Erasmus to subsequently leave. Well, from that day till his death, Oculopatius was for Basel what Zwingli was in Zurich and what Calvin would be in Geneva. The years 1529 to 1531 brought not only triumph for reform in Bern and Basel, but also the growing menace of hostile Catholic arms. Philip of Hesse, eager to forge an alliance among Protestants, hosted a summit at his castle in Marburg, 1531. The aim was for the reformers of the German, uh, of Germany and Switzerland to hammer out any sort of uh, differences that a theological united front might afford basis for a pact of mutual defense militarily. In conference, Oclampadius was paired with Luther, the two doctors of divinity there. Uh, they thought this will give us more hopes if we can put kind of the irascible Luther with uh, the Arenic Oculumpadius. And then in another room we'll have uh, Zwingli meet with Melanchthon. Again, the passionate Zwingli against the peaceable Melanchthon and maybe things will work out well. Well, swift agreement was attained on all points of faith. Save the Lord's Supper, which stubbornly remained an irreducible surd. Luther insisting upon the physical presence of the Lord's body in the elements, and Oclampadius urging a real but spiritual sacramental presence. Uh, and these differences and denunciations remain with us to this day. Well, Oclampadius returned to Basel and conducted visitations through the Basel lawn like a true shepherd, examining and encouraging the gospel preachers. Though he did not know it, his sands were running low. Autumn of 1531 was bleak and blighted for the Reform Party with the demise of Zwingli. News of the death of his friend on the battlefield was especially poignant to Oglampadius. Alas, he cried, I have long regarded him as my right arm. And perhaps the gloom and despondency of these sad tidings brought added strain to his already frail frame, laboring under a growing tumor in his chest. Only a few months before, he and Vibrandus 
his wife, had acquired a vineyard just outside the city walls of Basel, where they might watch their children play and enjoy the beauty of nature and friendship and rest a while from their incessant labors. It was a sweet summer for them. But there would be no further summer days together under their vine. Uh, the tumor grew worse, calling his wife and children, Eusebius, Irenae, and Aletheia, to his bedside. He spoke to them and blessed them one by one, exhorting them in Christ to bear the fruit of their names, godliness, peace, and truth. Uh, still so young, they answered only by tears. Then the old scholar patriarch stammered, Rejoice! I am going to a place of everlasting joy. My brethren, the Lord is there. He calls me away. Then he breathed his last, November 23rd, 1531. Though uh, less widely known than others of his Reformation brethren, Oculopatius in many ways was a forger and founder of the reformed wing of the Reformation Church. His biblical exegesis was recognized as so outstanding that sets of his commentaries were gifted to all the pastors of Strasbourg by Bucer. Zwingli said of his Isaiah commentary, quote, no other work has gone out which more fittingly could be called a cornucopia. Indeed, his was a profound influence, especially upon Bucer in Strasbourg, and then through him, through Bucer, upon John Calvin in his Strasbourg sojourn and subsequent home in Geneva. Oculopatius was the first of the reformers to make a biblical case and a call for lay elders. Very interesting. Uh, this had been absent from the church since sometime before Bishop Ambrose, because Ambrose has a little comment what is going on? We don't have any lay elders anymore. When did they go missing? So sometime before then. Uh, strange that they didn't do anything until Oculopatius shows up. But um, the, uh, uh, Yes, the, uh, also uh, Oculopatius placed excommunication in the church in the hands of those church elders, not the civil magistrates, which had been pretty much the universal prior pattern with it within the Roman church. Uh, Basel was the church where, as I mentioned, congregational singing emerged and prevailed, which Oculopatius encouraged and then defended theologically, uh, a practice which from there spread through all the Reformed churches. And uh, Calvin will do the same in Geneva from about 1537, I think. Uh, Oculopatius' work on the Lord's Supper arguing textually uh, from the scriptures and showing that a physical, actually actual bodily presence in the Lord's Supper was alien even to the early church perspective, uh, was so thorough and profound that it swayed Melanchthon, you remember the Lutheran Melanchthon, and caused him to break ranks with the, Lutheran, with the Lutherans. Calvin's view was essentially that of Oculopatius, Concerning the Lord's Supper, Calvin wrote, Hitherto, indeed, I have intentionally not dealt with the matter of the Lord's Supper because I was unwilling to do what had been done already. This was first performed with accuracy and skill by Oculopatius. <clears throat> well, less remembered, but not for that less worthy of memory. For aptly named... House lamp, Oculopatius, let his light shine such that the truth and practice of the gospel illuminated the lives of many, not only in Basel, his lampstand, but through its very brightness to churches afar off, both in place and in time. May we do our part to steward its flame.